are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. John Garcia, director of football recruiting at Sports Illustrated. Joining me once again to talk about Texas recruiting. I have to say, I know this is going to be one of John Garcia's favorite episodes he's done with me thus far because we're talking about a lot of Florida targets. And then we're talking about the SI-99, which, of course, he is in control of. And I even put on the Tampa Bay Rays hat for him. We're talking a lot of Florida today. But the first Florida prospect I want to talk about is the latest Texas commit, Cedric Baxter. And one point I want to make, we talk about his size, his athleticism, his speed, his ability to get skinny, get in the hole, jump cut, all of that. He's the whole package, his receiving ability. But what we don't talk about enough with all of these football players is their personality and the human nature of them. This Cedric Baxter is a player that was locked into the Longhorns since June, but he decided to announce on August 10th because that was his childhood best friend's birthday who passed away at the age of, I believe, eight or nine years old. I think eight. And even though yesterday was Cedric Baxter's big day, per his Instagram, he made sure to visit his childhood best friend's grave and drop off flowers and balloons and dedicated that day to his childhood best friend. So we talk about the athleticism and what all of these football players bring to the table, but the personality of these football players is what transforms programs and win games. And as special as a player as Cedric Baxter is, I think he's even a more special person. John, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that's a really great point, JD. You know, we we get in almost this NFL draft mode talking about all these guys, but yeah, they're people and, and they're kids and they're going through a whole lot of stuff that we'll never know unless they tell us. Uh so I think it takes it takes a big person to ad- admit all those things and and share in all of that. And I thought one other key point in that light, JD, was he said, you know, it was his friend's dream for football and the NFL and all that. And and Cedric kind of like inherited that and says, now I'm going to do that for you. Uh, so I, I think that's uh, a beautiful touch. Uh, just, just like it was when he pulled the big cowboy hat out and, and made the commitment. Um, you know, it's those things that, that should make him a fan favorite. You know, he's, he's like the prototypical Floridian, right? He's got the dreads, gold teeth, amazing athlete, a kid who lights up the room, big smile, big personality, all that stuff you want when you bring in a Floridian, a competitor, gritty, all that. But you also learn so much about, you know, the maturity that he brings to the table in addition to that. Um, so I think that's always a great point to hammer home. That's something you could you can never talk about enough. Uh, so salute to said and, and that entire family and, and the legacy he's living on. Absolutely. So staying in Florida, we know that Cedric Baxter is now the highest rated Uh, Florida recruit uh, to ever land at Texas out of the state of Florida, uh, Cedric Baxter. And it looks like they're trying to one up that in this class with the prospect (laughs) and Damon Wilson at the edge position. Uh, One of just the most freak athletes in the country, uh, one of the best edge prospects in the country right there in your backyard in the state of Florida. So talk about Damon Wilson. I, I thought it was interesting. Texas is in his top five. He said all of these programs are good at football, but I want to go where I feel at home. So just talk about maybe a potential Texas commit. What do you see in Damon Wilson? Why is he so special? Well, he just has two things that really can, can rise you up the ranks really quickly. He's, he's got unbelievable athleticism. I mean, I think that's really where it has to begin. His first step off the edge is kind of how you draw it up. You think of the modern edge prospect and it's a kid who's six, four, six, five, two thirty, who just freezes you off the line of scrimmage because he's so quick off the snap of the football. And then you talk about length and technique and all that stuff thereafter. Ben, certainly, he's got all that. But he also plays that premium position. He is an edge rusher. He's a guy who can put pressure on the quarterback immediately. Uh, He's also just had this steady rise physically. He's getting bigger and stronger really by the day. I had a buddy go watch him work out a couple weeks ago, and, and, and some of the numbers he was telling me in terms of what he was repping in the squat and the bench, they were staggering. Uh, for a kid who's who's not known as a big, powerful guy. He's known as more a speed rusher. So it was just one of those things, like I told you off the air, like we couldn't rank him high enough. I think when you put that trajectory, the athleticism, and the position all together, 
you know, this could be this could be the best defensive end in the country easily when, when all is said and done. So athletically, he brings a ton to the table. And, and like you said, it's hard to one up Cedric Baxter, who's number 21 in America overall. Like, it's not like he's way down the list or anything. But, yeah, Wilson uh, came in at number 17 and he might be going higher before all is said and done. Uh, again, we're, we're that high on him. I think he's going to have a huge year at Venice uh, this year. Venice has a great schedule, by the way. They play IMG. They play a lot of big-time programs. So we're going to find out a lot about Damon Wilson because he's going to face double teams and some situations where we really haven't seen him had to deal with. Uh, so I think if he gets through all of that, he's going to earn a lot of the praise he's getting. And I think something that's good for Texas in this recruitment, J.D., is – He's in no rush. He's in no rush to make this call. He's not going to make an emotional decision off of a visit or somewhere close to home, stuff like that. He's really going to take his time uh, throughout the process, take visits, allow the season to dictate where, where some of the pecking order may lie there in the 11th hour. And, and it's heavy hitters involved as well. So you, you wonder how they approach it, right? It's Alabama. It's Miami. Texas is certainly in there in the thick of it as well. So you wonder how those coaching staffs are going to prioritize them even as their seasons get going and, and that board starts to shrink in terms of high school prospects that are left because the Texases, the Alabamas of the world, even Miami, they're already at 20 plus commitments or close to that. So you wonder just how much effort is going to be put into a kid like Damon Wilson, but he deserves all of it. Yeah, I look, I'll say if they land Damon Wilson, that's probably the most important player in this class. You talk about an edge going into Florida and getting him competing with Alabama, Miami, Georgia, Ohio State schools like that. That probably would be the biggest get in the class. And oh, yeah, he's a really good football player as well. Also, shout out to the Texas recruiting class. You know, we talk about recruiting these commits so much, but not how these commits are recruiting other players. And he's already confirmed that uh, Jonte Cook, a Peyton Kirkland and a Samaje Burrell have reached out to him and tried to get him to the University of Texas. So shout out to them as well. Uh, another player in your backyard, a little bit bigger, Jordan Hall, nicknamed Big Baby out of yeah. Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> what makes him special? Uh, just a, a modern interior prospect. You know, he carries 300 pounds incredibly well. He's one of these guys that was under consideration for the 99, didn't quite make the cut, but he's got a lot of great football still ahead of him. And he's another one that's kind of in no rush. Uh, so I think that's so advantageous and interesting for Texas, which, you know, for compared to these other schools, especially in Jordan's case, got involved later. I think Texas was like his last major offer in the summer. And then he put out, you know, his top group. So it's not like uh, Texas has been recruiting him for an entire year. But again, you talk about, the buzz that UT has been able to spread really across the entire country. And then some of the Florida impact in particular, Cedric Baxter is very vocal. Peyton Kirkland is, is the most vocal in the state. You know, that stuff is, is going to start resonating with recruits uh, in the area. I saw Kirkland tweeting at Damon Wilson, I think yesterday. So this is something that, that could be a thing, you know, especially with the SEC move, uh, here soon, it, it makes sense. Florida is SEC territory now. So I do think that pairs very well for schools like Texas and Oklahoma jumping into the conference because now you can, you know, play games in your home state, you know, even though you're going, you know, to the state of Texas to play your college ball. So I think Texas is a school to keep an eye on as time goes forward for, for Jordan Hall. Uh, but it's going to be stiff competition again, just like we talked about with Wilson, Miami, Florida. Uh, Georgia, all involved here as well. So again, you wonder how those boards shift and change in the coming months because Hall, I don't even think has, has taken an official visit yet. So he's truly taking his time, maybe even more so than Damon Wilson. So it, there's always you know guys who go wire to wire in Florida and take it all the way to signing day. And we could be talking about two of them right now with Wilson and, and Hall for, for Texas. And I think that's a good thing. You you want to play the long game if you're the Longhorns with these guys because you're accumulating more resources in Florida. And obviously you've got the season ahead of you. Texas has a lot to gain on the field this year compared to Georgia, compared to Alabama, where you just you already know what you're getting. Texas has an opportunity to flip that on-field perception and now pair that with the buzz, the peer recruiting, all the momentum we're hearing uh, off the field and in recruiting itself. Uh, and I think that'd be huge for one or maybe even both of those prospects. Yeah, and shout out to Sadir Mitchell on that one. I know that Sadir Mitchell and uh, Jordan Hall had conversations about playing together at Georgia. Sadir Mitchell decided to come to Texas, and he's been recruiting him heavily, telling him uh, to come play next to him on that interior defensive line at the University of Texas. And like you said, uh, you know, a good group right there, right? Yeah. And like you said, 
you know, the long game really works for Texas. Jordan Hall has never even been to the state of Texas. So if they get on a roll this season, they start to win games. He comes to Texas, likes what he sees. It's different from these campuses that he's been on three or four times. That definitely could give a tex Texas an advantage in his recruitment of going in and trying to get their third or fourth prospect out of the state of Texas in one recruiting class. We're going to talk about the SI-99 next. And one thing that stood out to me, John Garcia had Darion Gallette rated higher than David Hicks. And Anthony Hill, I'm going to ask him about that next. First, a quick word from BetOnline. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Head to BetOnline today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. BetOnline, where the game starts. So, John, first, before we talk about Darion Gallette, I just want to give you the floor to talk about the SI-99. What was that process like this year? How fun was it doing, doing it this year? And... Yeah, just everything that went into it doing the SI ninety nine for the twenty twenty three class. Yeah, it was it was a lot. Um, usually, we're pretty top down, locked in early, right? Spring into the summer months, we feel really good about the top of the list. But because it's such a quarterback heavy class, and there were so many opportunities to see a lot of these quarterbacks in action, it took us a lot longer to settle on that number one prospect, which of course ended up being Dante Moore, who's headed to Oregon. So it took us longer to get to that first point. So naturally you got to kind of accelerate the rest of, of that process. So I think um, that combined with the news cycle being so much busier in the summer compared to years past made it very much a, a more difficult process, but there's always joy uh, in that struggle, if you will. And, and we got to watch a lot of tape, make a lot of phone calls uh, and hear a lot of pitches on, on why X players should be rated higher or lower sometimes that then maybe we had thought uh, initially and, and as as reporters and evaluators you have to weigh all of that right everything's a data point in the evaluation game uh so it's interesting to hear different perspectives pair that with our own evaluation our own gut feel and our own you know uh, track record of what we've seen so yeah it becomes a heck of a task and even down to the night before you know when we're on like 98 and 99 you're like mm, man I, I just i want to put this kid in but man, this kid's getting you know so much more praise in these areas or he plays this position so all things even he gets the benefit of the doubt so there was a lot of splitting hairs going on uh throughout this this 99 and we're gonna do it all over again after the season and 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 come out with that final list in january but it's always a combination of of relief uh but also you know accomplishment when we get that 99 up so really excited to continue to talk about it and, and see how uh, I guess smart we look at the end of the day or dumb, you know, open to all of it. Hey, Longhorn Nation, have no fear. Arch will be, uh, when it's updated in January, Arch will be at number one after the season, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so have no fear. Uh, so Darion Gallette, uh, one of the latest Texas commits out of Teague, he played his uh, high school football at Marlin, will not be playing this year due to a knee injury suffered over the summer. Is not likely to play, I should say. I don't want to put any limitations on him. Most people believe that Anthony Hill and David Hicks are the top two defensive prospects in the state of Texas. But obviously, according to the SI 99, you don't believe that because you have Darion Gallette rated higher than both of them. What went into that decision? Well, if we're talking top defensive prospects, we got Malik Muhammad as the number one player in, in, in the state defensively. Talk to um, him. Yeah. Yeah. Number two corner in America was, was really in the mix for number one. Um, but I think with between Gillette, Hicks and Hill, obviously three very different prospects, but we only talk about versatility with one of them. I think that's where Gillette really takes a step ahead because you can peg him kind of like we talked about with Dave, with Damon Wilson. You can peg him as a, hey, go rush the passer from the weak side kind of guy. Go get me double digit sacks and we're good. You can do that alone with Gillette. But here's the thing. You can also say, hey, go cover this slot receiver. Go cover this running back, which is a, a bigger and bigger deal every year. It feels like go cover the Cedric Baxters of the world uh, who are going to hurt you on third and, and medium. Or go captain the defense and get everyone else lined up and, and play the run. He can do everything. You know, we talked about the crazy numbers he put up as a receiver. My goodness, ball skills, coverage ability comes along with that. So I just think he can do everything at the second level. And I think that's why we were so polarizing on, on Hill versus Gillette. Uh, obviously, 
all great players. They're all in the 99. So let's not make it seem like these players aren't great. But I think when you talk about playing a premium position with that pass rushing ability and the versatility to come off of that and still be elite as a coverage linebacker or as a sideline to sideline guy who's equipped for space, which is what the modern game demands, there was just too much in his favor to go the other way, even with the injury, because he's so darn dynamic athletically. I think with Anthony Hill, you're getting a little bit more convention in his linebacker ability. Not a bad thing, but when you talk about opening it up to the modern game, we don't know the pass rushing upside. We don't know how consistently he can cover. We saw him cover a little bit this offseason. Wasn't great. So there's still some, some questions, more questions, with Anthony Hill on third down compared to a guy like Gillette. Now, on first and second down, Anthony Hill may be the best linebacker in America. Tackle to tackle, diagnosing plays, read and reacting and then finishing with power and short area explosion, those boxes are checked in Sharpie, which is great. But again, in the modern game, totally different deal. So if this was 1999, Anthony Hill would be a top 10 player in America. No disrespect. But in this iteration of the game, which, again, you have to update the evaluations relative to the modern game, just like brain surgeons have to do continuing education on the modern sciences, you have to continue to update. And in that regard, Gillette is just more valuable than Hill at the linebacker position. And then when you talk about David Hicks, you know, I, I think there's a lot of questions there with the upside. The floor is great. I think he's an inside out defensive lineman, but he wants to profile as an outside in defensive lineman, but he's 270 pounds, 6'3", 6'3 and a half. So he's going to carry more weight, more than less weight, right? It's a, it's very odd to see a guy shed 25 pounds and say, hey, I'm going to go be an edge rusher because we hadn't seen that on tape. You talk about that, transferring high schools a bunch as well, which is going to continue to push him inside, by the way. I just think that creates a, a lot more question marks with the ceiling of his game. And I actually threw out a nice comp for him Today in a piece, we did a mailbag on the most polarizing players. Arch Manning's in there, by the way. Read it at SI.com. But with Hicks, we comped him to Demarcus Walker, a great, great college player. But when you talk about the upside as a pass rusher, it feels relatively limited. And again, in the modern constructs of college football, it starts with the ability to impact the passing game. So that's why we're not as high on Hicks compared to, to some other outlets out there. But again, all 99 guys, all very, very good. All guys that Texas fans, Texas A&M fans, whoever gets these guys are obviously, you know, you're getting great players who are going to make an impact pretty early. Yeah, it wasn't going to be hard to convince me, but you definitely did. And, and I'll just add to one point that you made. I haven't seen a video of David Hicks or Anthony Hill catching an alley-oop in the middle of a basketball game. So, uh, you know, I know that didn't factor, doesn't hurt the eval, that didn't factor into the SI 99 rankings, but it sure didn't hurt. So we talk about receivers all the time, and this is a very talented receiver class. Yeah. But, you know, I think a lot of the different sites have the receiver rankings a little bit different based off of what they like and what they see upside projection. A lot of Texas fans feel like Jonte Cook is rated a little bit too low on most sites. However, you have him as the third best wide receiver in the country. What went into that decision? Well, I mean, if you go on what we know, uh, you look at that 2021 season. I think Jonte averaged a touchdown every like two catches. Yeah. Uh, and it's not like he caught seven catches on the year. I mean, it was it was a ton of, of production. So I think the tangible of, again, going to the modern elements of the game, wide receiver is more important than it's ever been, right? So you almost elevate that as its own premium position. You look at the production and say, okay, this kid does it where it counts most on Friday nights, which, let me reiterate, is the, the beginning of every evaluation. It is about Friday night lights. Everything else is a supplement to that game evaluation. So in that regard, he's arguably the best in the country. And then you start supplementing it with the track times, the 40 times, what we see, the quickness and the polish he brings as a route runner, the competitiveness that we see during the offseason seemingly every weekend – and it really only elevates your opinion of, of Jonte Cook. Um, you talk to his trainers, Margin Hooks, who's trained all these great players in Texas, and it's like, this might be the best one. You know, even that consideration should give some benefit of the doubt in that regard. So don't care about the size. Yeah, he's 175 pounds or whatever it is. But, I mean, look at the NFL. I mean, that that is what it is moving towards, these smaller, shiftier space players uh, that impact the game at, at a very high level. I mean, Jane Waddle. 
Jalen Waddle was 165 pounds when he got to Alabama. Nope, nobody was worried about it. You know, I'm not saying Cook is that, but he's closer to that than not. Uh, so I think that's why he got the nod. And th really, there was no question he was going to be ranked high. The question was the position because we rank slot receivers at SI as well. So we were more back and forth on slot versus receiver. Um, and we went with traditional receiver because he can line up everywhere and, and do considerable damage. And, and we wanted to highlight that as opposed to maybe locking him into that slot box, which sometimes is viewed as a negative connotation. Although we think, again, it's a great thing because that's where the game has gone. And, and those are starting positions nowadays. Ryan Niblett at 52 talked to Longhorn Nation about why he made the SI 99 and why you have him pretty much almost in the top half. Yeah, another another guy who, my gosh, the production is crazy. The the juice that he brings to the table is crazy as a slot receiver. He was ranked as a slot, I believe, the number two uh, or three slot in the entire class. Uh, and again, it's it's well earned. I mean, he's a polished returner, uh, slot receiver, route runner. He brings a lot to the table as an extremely high floor prospect, despite some dimin diminutive size that, that he brings to the table physically. Again, you talk about Jalen Waddle as another Texan who faced some of those same, you know, pushbacks coming out of uh, Episcopal there in the Houston area. And nobody's worried about that anymore. It's just not a part of what the fear uh, of scouting should, should bring out of you. And I think that's why Niblet uh, gets elevated so high. One of the fastest players in America and one of the most productive receivers in America. You can't deny that type of, of ability. Uh, so I think he's a guy who maybe could be ranked higher in, in the final ranking. I don't see his production slowing down. I don't see our opinion of him changing a whole lot between now and January, just as, as high floor slot receiver as there is in this entire class. I mean, Zach, Zach Branch, who was the number one slot receiver, he's a, like a unicorn. You know, he's like his own category. Any other class, I mean, you, you could be looking at Ryan Niblett as the number one slot receiver in the country. That's the type of talent he brings, and that's the type of receiver class that, that Texas uh, is building in a hurry. So I'm going to get you out of here on this. I want to ask you, there's a lot of Texas commits in the top 99, but, of course, all 22 of them aren't in there. Right. But they have their senior season. The SI 99 is updated in January. They have their senior season to make an argument for why John Garcia Jr. should put them in the SI 99. So I'm going to ask you, out of all of the Texas commits that aren't in the SI 99, who is the most likely to end up there in January? But before you answer that, I'm going to see if I can get into the mind of the director of football recruiting at Sports Illustrated. If I had to guess who you're about to say, I would say it's Sadir Mitchell. Am I right oh. or wrong? And why? Hundred percent right. This this class is lacking depth on the interior defensive line. It's just not a great year. I think uh, five or six made the ninety nine. So there's naturally room for that list to change, whether it's the top five or six, or actually expanding that list. And we talk about Sadir Mitchell being a, a massive human being, and he's playing at a program in Bergen Catholic up in Jersey. That plays a great schedule every year, which means we're going to have access to those streams, those television views, and have a firsthand look at what he does almost in real time. So when you start to play against great competition, we, we, we worry less about the region of the country you're from or the competition you play day to day, because when you do step up, you still have an opportunity to show up in, in those moments. And it's really hard to slow down. 300 plus pounds uh, with the type of leverage that Sadir plays with. He was in consideration already for the 99. And again, the, the lack of depth at that position really screams movement. That That's the type of position where you could see the entire ranking upside down come January. Because again, a lot of these guys are, are massive human beings. There's going to be some weight fluctuation. There could be some positional changes that some of these guys deal with, and that could be good or bad uh, for their senior seasons. And, and we weigh, those senior years extremely heavily. Uh, that's really what it's about there in the end. So we want to see guys who step up junior year to senior year and not just reward them from that sophomore to junior year jump, which is what the list obviously reflects more of uh, right now. Longhorn Nation, John Garcia, Jr., Director of Football Recruiting at Sports Illustrated, joining me once again. Make sure you go check out that SI-99. And once again, remember, it will be updated in January after the senior season. So if you see something you don't like, just be patient, my friend. As always, peace.